Are you merciful? Why? Because Jesus healed the sick. Because Jesus fed the multitudes. Because Jesus gave legs to the crippled. Because Jesus granted sight to the blind. Because Jesus opened the ears of the deaf. Because Jesus found prostitutes and tax collectors and drew them into the sphere of his love. Because Jesus touched the untouchable and loved the unlovable and forgave the unforgivable and welcomed the undesirable. Because Jesus even now saves the otherwise unsavable. Why? Because they deserve it. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done in righteousness. Not because we met Him halfway. Not because we took the proper steps forward and in good faith have elevated ourselves to the place of the deserving poor, but according to His mercy. We are here because Jesus Christ didn't say with cold indifference, give them what they deserve. They brought it on themselves. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God. And seeing us in our misery and need, He doesn't just feel for us. He takes the necessary action to relieve our distress. He leaves the eternal glory of heaven and the perfect fellowship of the Trinity. He condescends to us, lives among us, suffers like us, dies for us. Do you understand this? Have you experienced this? How then is it possible to experience it and not display it? It isn't possible. You haven't experienced it if you don't display it. The evidence of God's mercy in your life isn't determined by how much theology you know, by how many books you read, but by your active goodness to people in misery and in need. Blessed are the merciful. So we're in part number five of our series on the Beatitudes. Again, I'm going to go fast through some of the points and slower on others. On the Welcome Center, there is a sheet that gives you every single point in every, almost every scripture. So don't feel like you have to write feverishly. And we also post them usually every Monday online as well. But we're in week number five of the eight Beatitudes. If you're called to follow Christ... You're called to serve. To be a servant is also to be a minister. Everyone in this room that calls themselves a Christian is a minister. Did you know that? Did you know that you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's different than being a pastor and being called to preach all the time. But all of us are called to minister all the time. We all minister in different ways. But anytime you help somebody else in Jesus' name, it's called doing ministry. And like the video, if you paid attention, shows if you're not displaying it, you have not truly experienced it. And we're going to look at two parables this morning when the Pharisees thought they understood what mercy was. And Jesus says, you don't even understand what mercy is. How can you even display it? God wants us to be what I call agents of mercy. There's not enough mercy in Fall River. There's not enough mercy on your Facebook page. There's not enough mercy in your family. This morning, I want to talk about mercy. In the fifth key to a blessed life, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In other words, what you give out you're going to get back. There's another scripture that says, what you reap, you will, there you go. 
This is the fifth key to a blessed life. So what is mercy? Usually when we think of mercy, it's forgiving people that don't deserve it, which it is. Helping people who can't help themselves, which it is. But let me go a little bit further. Mercy, which by the way is part of God's character, has so much more to say and to do in your life than simply those things. Mercy is like a diamond ring or a diamond. It has multi-facets, multiple layers. I want us to look at seven of those this morning. Don't be afraid by the number seven. We will go through them quickly. And I think if you can get mercy truly down in your life, it will change your relationships, your marriage, your friendships, your coworker relationships, and everything else in your life. But you have to learn to be an agent of mercy. So first, quickly, why in the world should we care about being merciful? I'll tell you. It's kind of the introduction to it. So the first reason is God has shown us mercy. How many people have received the mercy of the living God? If you're here this morning, you've experienced it whether you know it or not, just by getting up this morning, breathing, and being in a nice, somewhat cool sanctuary, you've experienced the mercy of God. Mercy is talked about all through scripture. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, he brought us to life, yes, with Christ. It is by God's grace you have been saved. God has shown us mercy. The point is this, God wants me to act in the same way to other people. He wants me to pass on the mercy that I've, that I've received from God. There's a story in scripture about an unmerciful boss, um, an unmerciful employee. In scripture, it often says king, but in this situation, we'll change it to like a boss because back in the, the New Test Old Testament, New Testament, kings often were like bosses of people. So anyways, there was this king that an employee, owed, oh, I'm getting myself all confused here. There was a dude that owed money to another dude and he said, you know what? I'm gonna wipe your slate clean because, and I just want to, just because. So he wiped it away. So you think that guy experienced mercy and he should be grateful. But instead he had a guy that owed him money and he decided to grab him by the throat and say, either you pay me or I'm gonna put you in prison. And he ended up putting him in debtor's prison. And then the first king, the boss said, dude, didn't I just show you mercy and grace and forgive you? So he said, you're horrible, and he threw him in jail. So because all of us have received God's mercy and grace, we need to do the same thing. The idea, too, is like when you're at Dunkin' Donuts and the person in front of you paid for you, you pay it forward sometimes to the person behind you, and then you find out they have a family of eight in the car, and you're like, oh. So we need to show it. Matthew 18.33 says, shouldn't, shouldn't you have showed mercy on others just as I have had mercy on you? God says, if I show mercy to you, I expect you to show it to other people. Number two, the second reason, God commands us to be merciful. So being merciful, you're simply obeying what God has commanded you to do. Micah 6, 8, God has told you what is good and what he requires from you. So the next part of the verse is telling us the three things God expects of us as believers. To do what is right with others, to love being merciful to others, and to live humbly in fellowship with God. If you want to summarize what life is all about, doing those three things. One third of the requirement that God has for you is being merciful. 33.333 whatever percent of your calling on this earth is to be merciful. Let me shock you with this next statement. God says that being merciful is more important than worship. Did you hear that? God says that you being merciful to people is actually much more than worship. All the worship teams are like, what? <laughs> Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your sacrifice, I simply want you to be merciful. Because see, often we'll come to church, we'll be, there's nothing better than you. But then we'll get in the car and not be merciful to the people that love us the most. Or we'll go to work the next day after singing praises to God and we're not showing mercy. 
We're being just like the Pharisees. Everybody can see us worshiping, but when we're alone with somebody or at work, this, that, and the other, we're not being merciful. The things that are coming out of my mouth aren't being merciful. And why are we always hurting the people close to us? Because we're closest to them, right? Pastor Erica and I are rubbing elbows all the time. So, of course, she's going to be the first one. If I'm going to be unmerciful, it's going to come out. Number three, I'm going to need more mercy in the future. Between now and the time we get called to heaven, I'm going to mess up. You're going to mess up. And we need God's mercy. James 2.13 says, you must... You must show mercy to others or God won't show mercy to you. Woo! I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy. On that judgment day when I stand before him, dude's going to have a huge phone book of things that I've done. I want all the mercy I can get. Yes, I am forgiven, but I want God's mercy on judgment day. It says the person who shows mercy can stand without fear on judgment day. I don't know about you, I want to stand that way on Judgment Day. Number four of reasons why we care about mercy, showing mercy brings or causes happiness. Who wants to be happy, right? We all want happy. We all want to wake up in the morning with a smile on our face, get out of bed. It doesn't happen in my house most often. I get up, I don't want to talk to anybody, I want my Nespresso, I want to sit on the couch. Usually when Pastor Eric and I are home, we just look at each other so, and we drink our coffee. Usually after the first coffee, we're happy. But showing mercy is a source of happiness. Proverbs 14, 21 says, if you want to be happy, be kind to those in need. He says, it's a sin to despise anyone. Rhetorical question this morning, meaning please don't raise your hand, but how many of you has despised anyone this week? And did you even think to say, God, please forgive me for despising that person? No, we don't often think that we're sinning, but we are sometimes. Proverbs eleven seventeen says, a merciful person helps himself, but a cruel person hurts himself. So when we're being merciful, we are actually helping ourselves. Proverbs eleven seventeen in the Living Bible says, your own soul is nourished when you show mercy. So how can we learn these, these qualities of mercy this morning? Let me give you the seven, and we're going to get going quickly, but the things are in the back there. Number one, be patient with people's quirks. You all have them. We all have different quirks, right? Idiosyncrasies, ways we act, things that irritate, angry, uptight, rub us the wrong way, mannerisms, irritating habits, things we speak and how we talk. But this is just a very practical way. I want to give you maybe the most important marriage advice. The newlyweds are back. They had a great time in Virginia. It's good to see you both matching t-shirts. This is what we're going to expect from now on. Ephesians 4.2 says, be patient with each other. Be patient with each other. After being away for two weeks together, you got to be patient. Making allowances for each other's faults. Making allowances for each other's faults. Why? Because of your love. Notice the phrase, making allowance. Making allowance for each other's faults. I said it in your, in your wedding that your wedding was the union of two great forgivers. Because unless you can be into a marriage or a relationship and be a forgiver, the marriage won't last. In every relationship, we have to have forgiveness. We have to show mercy. When you get in the car this afternoon with your family, your, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, show mercy. The Bible says we show mercy by being patient with each other's quirks. By being patient with your kids, your spouse, your friends. How do we get more patience? How, how, how? One word, wisdom. I was thinking about this yesterday as Pastor Miro was here last week. And early on in my ministry, he was the one that was always yelling at me for what I posted on Facebook. Pastor Rob! Now get, don't, don't get it twisted. I wasn't posting inappropriate stuff, but I wasn't posting stuff worthy of being a man of God on Facebook. It's hard to explain what it is, but it wasn't bad. 
but it wasn't above reproach. It was often airing the dirty laundry because back then I was going through a difficult time. So Joe Smo did something to me. I wanted to kind of put it in a sideway on Facebook. Can you believe some Christians would do this? Luis knew what I was doing. He called me up, take that off of Facebook right now. So I had Luis in my ear. It was like the Holy Spirit. Luis, Pastor Erica was in the distance because we were still dating. You know, she wasn't right in the ear. But over the years, even when I hang out with people, people, some people think I just say what comes out of my mouth. Listen, that's with a filter now. I used to have no filter. I used to say things and insert foot in my mouth all the time. But after years of being 25, 46, there's a lot of wisdom that I've gained, and it's not of myself, it's of the Holy Spirit. It's of Pastor Erica, it's of Pastor Luis, it's of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily that order. But you gain wisdom over the years. Now looking back at my teenage years and my, my young adult years and my college years, I'm like, man, I wish I had that type of wisdom back then. James chapter three says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. Wisdom is full of mercy. So the wiser you get, the more merciful you get. A lot of people who think they're wise, they're, on, they're not. They're pompous. They think they know everything, but they don't. And the old Rob would have told them that they didn't, but now I let the Holy Spirit do that. Unless you come into the office for counseling, then I might just tell you how it is. But I make you sign a waiver. I will not leave the church if Pastor Rob is honest with me. That was a joke. Ooh, tough crowd. All right. If you're easily irritated, if you're unwilling to yield, you probably don't have the wisdom you should have. Number two, how can we demonstrate mercy this week is help anyone hurting around you. Help anyone hurting around you. I don't know about you, but even when I go on my little walks through Fall River, I always bump into people that could use help. It doesn't always have to be financial. Listen, the church only has so many dollars. Pastor Rob's bank account, Pastor Erica shut me off a few times, only has so much bank account money to give away to people. But if it was up to me, I'd spend every penny the church has helping the people on the streets. Trust me, we come pretty close to that. But you're always going to have people around you that could use help in some way, shape, form. Now that we've talked about it, it's going to happen this week to every single person, or you'll at least see it. For me, we had leftover $5 gift cards for Dunkin' Donuts, so I... I, I, I carefully unwrap it when Connie can't see me so she doesn't see me breaking her ribbons and bows. And I put them in my pocket. So when I walk around the city, I have a I prayed for you thing and a Dunkin' Donut gift card. If I talk to somebody, I give it to them. I talk with them. If the door opens, I pray with them. I'll talk with them. I'll minister to them. Tell them they can get food here. But sometimes it's simply just giving them the thing, hey, have a great day. And people are so unused to it, I don't know if that's the right wording, they're not used to being shown that, that their eyes light up. So don't be afraid to shock some person this week. If you care, you will be aware. That goes for the people in your church and the people in our community. As we do the park outreach on Wednesday nights, we're getting to know more and more people, and we're getting to know more and more families, and I'm getting called across the street to talk to this grandmother, this mother. Tell me about church. Tell me about baptism. Tell me about this. Do you have a food pantry? Yes, we do. But there's only two or three of us that go down there every Wednesday, so there's only so much that we can do. Imagine a Wednesday night where the entire church shows up to love on the Griffin Street Park. Vanessa would be in her glory. She's down there by herself holding up the street with Aiden and the girls. But how great would it be? Yes, you don't have to go to that park, but you need to be showing mercy. You need to be showing grace to people throughout the week in order to call yourself a Christian. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself without being merciful. Proverbs 3.27 says, whenever you possibly can, do good to those that need it. Sometimes you gotta go looking for it. 
Romans 12, 8 says, when you do acts of mercy, show mercy with cheerfulness. That's a good word, to do it with a smile on your face, to do it even as you're giving away your Dunkin' Donut gift card that somebody gave you or your Starbucks gift card. Do it with cheerful because God loves a cheerful giver, amen? That doesn't just mean when you give the offering, you should be cheerful then too. Let me tell you a secret. It's less painful if you sit. It's an automatic giving, so you don't have to write the check out every week. It's a little, you know, sometimes it's painful when you open up your bank account statement, but it's a little easier when you set it and forget it. All right, number three, give people a second chance. I don't know about you, but I serve a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances. Thank God for second chances. But some of you need to be giving other people in your life a second chance too. Now there is a little asterisk with this. Obviously there's certain situations where you can love, forgive, and forget, but you don't need to give them a second chance. It's not what I'm talking about. Those are certain circumstances. But we serve a God that forgave us even when we spit in his face and hurt him. When, when things and people hurt us at work, usually we like to do one of two things. One, get even, or two, write them off, right? Sometimes it's the flesh. Well, yeah. <laughs> the wisdom, again, stopped me from saying something about something. But when you get insulted at work, your, your flesh went right back. It's that mimic gene we talked about a few weeks ago. So you could get right back, or you could just write them off. But when you get back at them or write them off, you're still on their level. But when you have the grace and the mercy of God to forgive them, or when they insult you to smile and be like, hey, God bless you. It's okay. You feel it? I'm sorry you feel that way. Have a great day. Then you're above them. Then you're superior to them because you took the high road. We think that's just an old folklore of taking the high road, but it's true. It's hard to bite your tongue sometimes. But remember, we've talked about it a lot. A soft answer turns away wrath. So sometimes you have to give yourself, give other people a second chance. So how would you rate yourself on mercy this week? How would you rate yourself on being bitter, angry, using harsh words, yelling at people, cursing at people, getting rude back to people? This is between you and God inside. Or are you always kind, merciful, forgiving other people? How would you rate yourself on that this week? We want Christ the Rock to be known, not for our building, not for our awesome air conditioning system, but not for our music or anything else. We want Christ the Rock to be known that it's a church of mercy. That when you messed up, it's okay. You can walk through that door. You can sit right next to the pastor. Because we serve a God of second chances, a God that loves us and cares about us. I don't want Christ the Rock to be known for anything else but the saving grace of our God. But I can't be everywhere in the city, so you guys are all representing Christ the Rock. You're representing Jesus. You like to wear the shirts. Some of you have bumper stickers on, the little magnets. We threw one on Pastor Luis's as he said, we said goodbye to him. So in Pennsylvania, there's a Christ the Rock thing floating around. But you are sometimes the only Jesus that anyone will see in, in their day. And if they were to judge Jesus by your actions, would they love Jesus or hate Jesus? Think about that. Number four, we are to do good to those that hurt us. If you really boil it down, mercy is giving people what they need not what they deserve. That's mercy. Because that's what God did for us. There's a saying, hurt people hurt people. Meaning if somebody's hurting you, that's probably because they're hurting inside as well. Because the natural flesh outside of Christianity, I'm hurting, I'm going to hurt you. I'm hurting, I'm going to hurt you. The people you want to love the least are probably the people that need it the most. The most hurtful people are those who need massive doses of love and of mercy. Let me ask you, just think in your mind this morning, who's hurt you the most in life? Think about it, who's hurt you the most in life? 
They may need your mercy. Listen, I had a biological father that walked out in me when I was four years old. I remember the story. I mean, I remember the day because I was playing with my yellow Tonka trucks. Him and my mom were fighting in the other room. He slammed the door and my fingers were in the door. Now, he didn't mean to do that on purpose, but that b- burns it into my brain for all my life. So that's bad enough, right? I got a great stepdad that came into my life when I was probably five or six. I don't know if I have that number right. And he's still a great dad to this day. But my biological father decided to come back into my life when I was 16. I was like, woo, I got a dad again, blah, blah, blah. We went out. He was funny, quirky. He looked like me. I thought he was a good looking man. We went out for dinner. When he dropped me off, he said, hey, don't forget to brush your teeth. Like he's trying to be a dad. I was like, oh, this is cool. The next day we were supposed to go out. I sat on the front porch all day. He never showed up. Talk about hurt. Talk about resentment. Now fast forward, I was 16, maybe 20 years later, 15 years later. I'm with Pastor Erica. We're, we're dating. There's still that hurt inside. I get a phone call from Bob. I'm named after my dad. Hey, Bobby. Like nothing had happened, right? I didn't want to talk to this guy. But something inside said, let him talk. And then as we began to unpack the conversation, we ended up getting together, having lunch or dinner, I can't remember. And he began to tell me what God did in his life. That he was diagnosed years before with brain cancer. That he was dying. That he needed to make things right. That he found God down in uh, Georgia. And he was going to church and his pastor said he needed to make things right with people in his life. He was in the Worcester area. Could he get together with me? So we got together and we talked. And then we became close for maybe a year, two years. And then he passed away. I didn't want to forgive him. I didn't want to be merciful to him. It was crazy. None of this is in my notes. None of it. I didn't even think of it till this moment. That's what the good thing about God, the Holy Spirit is. So I don't know who that speaks to this morning. I, have, I, I was blessed to have two dads. My, my current dad, Chuck, which he's been here to visit. I don't call him my stepdad, he's my dad. But my other dad, hey, God had to do something inside of me and I know I'll see him again one day because he accepted the Lord. Did he screw up royally? Yes. Did he deserve my forgiveness? No. Did he need it? Yes, he wanted it. So I gave it to him, and God allowed us to go to church together, worship together, spend time together. He didn't get it to get to my wedding. He passed away before the wedding, but he got to see Eric and I, and he got to see his, his grandkids. So God did something special. So do good to those that hurt you. Number five, be kind, the Bible says, to those that offend you. I know these all seem similar, but they really are different. In this day and age, Christians are being attacked all the time for taking a stance. And often people call us to the carpet and say that we're bigots or say that we're hate, we're this, we're that, we're others. And sometimes Christians want to get up on their high horse. Well, the Bible says this and blah, 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 blah. At that moment, you need to make a decision. Do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? Do you want to make a point in their face? Ha, I put them in their place. But will they ever experience the love of God and the truth that you stand for? Or will they continue down that path and end up in hell anyways? You don't realize the words and actions, even on Facebook. The world is watching what you write, what you do, even on threads. Although there's a million people on threads and I never have anybody like my post on threads. I don't know. Whatever social media you're on, or if you're not on social media, when you're at the coffee shop, you're at work, the way you act represents the Lord. So when people do attack you for being a Christian, what did Jesus do? He turned the other cheek. As men, we don't want to turn the other cheek, right? We want to put up our dukes. We want to eat our spinach and get ready. But the Bible says to turn the other cheek. Because there's so many people that are always going to go head to head with them when they come up with somebody that's humble and be like, bro, does it make you feel better to punch me? No, I'm not saying this to anybody else, but someone like me and Devin, right? We're out in the streets. That's nothing, bro. That's what we want to say. But like, oh, does it make you feel better? I'll pray for you while you punch me. I think it was um, David Wilkerson was on the streets or Nikki, no, David Wilkerson met Nikki Cruz. 
And Nikki Cruz was a gang member in New York, and he said, I'm going to cut you preacher into a million pieces. And he had the knife out right in front of him. He said, go ahead, those million pieces will still love you and pray for you. It's the same idea when Jesus was on the cross, right? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Be kind to those people that offend you. Be kind to the people that hurt you. Now, I skipped a bunch of verses, and they'll be on that sheet in the back. But number six, these last two are going to be a little bit more of a conundrum to some of you. But number six, build bridges of love to the unpopular. Build bridges of love to the unpopular. There are people that you work with, that you go to school with, that you live near, that tell jokes differently, they tell, or you tell jokes behind their back. They have those quirks. They live different lifestyles. They have different belief systems. They go to different churches, different religions. They dress differently. Some of them aren't popular. Some of them are outcasts. This is a facet of your ministry that is often overlooked. Building a bridge of love to the unpopular is what I call premeditated mercy. When you hear the word premeditated, you often think of murder because it's used all the time. Premeditated murder. I determine I'm going to go out and I'm going to But think about if you use premeditated mercy, today I'm going to find five people to love on in the name of Jesus, to be premeditated, and then go to the people that nobody else wants to talk about. Go to the people that nobody else wants to love, that nobody else wants to help. Why does God want us to build bridges of love to the unpopular and specifically to unbelievers? Because they're never going to come to Christ unless they see Christians that walk the walk and talk the talk. And the number one way to bring a non-believer to Christ is by becoming their friends. How many people, you don't have to raise your hands, how many people are friends with unbelievers? And I know a lot of us grew up in churches, well, you, Bobby, you can't be friends with non-Christians. And I get it as parents, right? You want your kids to be around the right people. But Jesus was friends with non-believers. He was at non-believers' houses. Matthew, a tax collector, scum of the earth. Back then, tax collectors weren't awesome like they are today. Tax collectors were cheaters. They were allowed to cheat people. So Jesus went to Matthew's house and was hanging out with tax collectors and other people. And the Pharisees of that day said, oh, how could you do something like that? And Jesus is like, you don't understand what mercy is. You don't get what mercy is. The Pharisees were attacking Jesus for hanging out with the wrong crowd. And Jesus says, you know what your problem is, guys? You don't understand the true mercy, what true mercy is. Because if they knew it, because they were stuck in the mindset that it was just forgiving people and helping people who needed it. Mercy also included building bridges to the unpopular. And Jesus says it here. He says, I'm going to go to a party with people that nobody wants to hang out with, with the the ill repute, the unpopular, the fringe, the negative, the criminals, the riffraff. Why? Because I understand mercy. And he tells them again to go look at Hosea 6.6. Now, I want you to notice because there's a lot of truth here. Matthew invited them. When is the last time you invited an unbeliever for dinner, for coffee, to church, to do anything? The more you grow in your Christian faith, often the times, the more you only hang out with Christians. It is important for us to build bridges to other people. Have you ever had a notorious sinner in your home, besides yourself, obviously? You need to be merciful. This is where the rubber meets the road. Do you have any uh, close unbelieving friends? Because if you don't, you're not being like Jesus. The problem is the longer you're a Christian, the more you hang out with the same type of people. I want to stretch you this morning to think about who you could reach out to this week. You don't have to be BFFs and go see the Barbie movie with them. You don't have to. But you could go have coffee with them. You go to the farmer's market with them. You can hang out in the park with them. The people I see on Wednesday nights, do I hang out with them all the time? No. But when I see them on Wednesday, like, hey, what's up? And we get to talk, rap, whatever. 
It's developing that relationship with them. Because the more I hang out with them, the more that that happens, the more they'll likely want to come to church. It doesn't have to be Christ the Rock, but it's got to be a Bible-believing church so that they can know Jesus so they can go to heaven one day. But I want to warn you, if you begin to do this, you will be criticized by the legalistic people. And they'll attack you, they'll get mad at you. You know why? Because they did it to Jesus back then. And they'll do it to us today. And people have called my life and everything into question by that too for me. But guess what? I want this church to be known as a hospital. Yes, I want to be able to feed people. I want you guys to be fed spiritually. And getting into the fall, we're going to go through a whole variety of deep, deep things in the Word of God on Thursday nights. But Sunday mornings, or when we can invite our non-Christian friends to come in a safe place under the anointing and the power of God with awesome worship, kids ministry, nursery, and the power of the Word of God. So those that sometimes say, well, you just, you just throw out bread to us. Yeah, but some of the people around you are eating that bread up and their lives are being changed. Jesus didn't need the approval of the Pharisees, and you guys don't either. Jesus knew his mission was simply to seek and save the lost. That is our mission today, is to seek and save the lost. All right, number seven, and again, there'll be more details on that sheet. Number seven, value relationships over rules. Value relationships over rules. If you're a rule keeper or you work in HR in your company, you're going to be like, what? Jesus would say it this way, put people before policies. Romans 13 10 says, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if you're doing the loving thing, it's genuinely for the ben their benefit, not yours. For their benefit, you're doing the right thing. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus' disciples were walking through a field and they began to pick wheat, but they picked it on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees were judging. How could they break the laws and the commandments by picking wheat on the Sabbath? And Jesus is like, man was made for the Sabbath and not Sabbath for the man. So he was trying to get the point across that if you get so caught up in legalism and rules like that, you forget about the people. The disciples were taking the wheat to feed themselves because they had done ministry all day. But the Pharisees were blinded by what they thought was right and, and wrong. Jesus was saying, I put love before law. I put people before procedures. I put relationships but before rules and regulations. And he says, you guys don't get it because you don't understand the meaning of mercy. He says, I want you to go and read the scripture. I don't want your sacrifice, I want your mercy. This week, I want you to be challenged in your heart. God doesn't want just your worship. He wants you to show mercy this week. So my prayer is this week that each and every one of you would show mercy to someone in some way. And by doing that, you're going to receive God's blessings and happiness. You're doing it to be obedient, but you're doing it because God has commanded it as well. As I close, can you go overboard on mercy? Absolutely. Jesus did. It's called the cross. On the cross with his outstretched arms, he says, I'm doing this to be merciful. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the most over-the-top example of mercy ever. He let them beat him, scourge him, spit at him, put a crown of thorns, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This morning as we close, Jesus died on that cross not so you can just come to church on Sundays and go home and punch your card, but he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven, but then he wants you to share that love and that mercy with other people because there's people outside of these walls that are dying and going to hell every single day. If anything over the last month has taught us, you don't know how short your time can be. So what are you doing to make a difference in the world? I don't want a church of casual Christians I want a church of people that are hungry, that chase after God, but then put those words into action when they leave these doors. Amen? Stand with me this morning.
Father God, we thank you this morning for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your ultimate act of love on that cross. But Lord, on that cross, you died for our sins, Lord, because sin is sin. Hell is still real. But God, you're still on the throne, Lord. So for those of us that need forgiveness from our sins, please, Lord, forgive us right now. For those of us that have purposely not been merciful to people, which ends up being a sin, because in Scripture it says, if you know the good you ought to do and don't do it, it's sin. Forgive us today, God. Help us have a clean slate this week. And as those doors open, that we will hear testimonies of what people have done this week in your name, God. I pray that you'll bless the rest of the service, um, the Portuguese service next, the kids' time outside, the fellowship, God. But Lord, bless your people above and beyond what they could ever imagine this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. This pastor loves you. I'll see you downstairs or outside. <laughs>